Welcome to today's episode of A Facilitator's Journey. Today I'm joined by Mark Cranston, CEO of Total Negotiation. In this episode, we are going to be talking about how his business went from a lifestyle business, which he co-founded with Mark Grice, into a multinational, international, multi-million pound business. Um, we have great conversations that look at three core areas that we should be focusing on when we're having conversations with our customers and our clients. We talk about advice on how to manage our stakeholders. And Mark also shares his thoughts on what makes a great associate. Enjoy today's episode. Hello. How are you doing, Mark? I'm great. How are you? I'm very well indeed. So a question I ask all my guests is, how do we know each other? Ooh. You and I met in 1999. I had just left Mars Confectionery. Uh, I was joining Guinness. We were about to sponsor the Rugby World Cup, and you were the Rugby World Cup lady who had tickets, merchandises, fleece balls, anything to do with the Rugby World Cup. You were that lady. That's a good memory. And you, you were and very I popular, had... la- very we popular were. lady always, and particularly at that time. And I'd only just really started then at that time as well, because I joined in March '99, and we had the joys of going into the likes of Tesco at that time for you, was it? I started off with Sainsbury's and Morrison's and gradually worked my way up to the lovely Tesco. Yeah. So you've got a strong commercial background, which has now translated into what you are doing today. So you are the CEO and co-founder of a business called Total Negotiation. Can you just share with us what is Total Negotiation about? So Total Negotiation, we are a global business. We provide uh, training and consulting primarily in negotiation. But actually, as the years have gone by, what we've done is we've increased the number of disciplines that we train and consult in, all in service of delivering better negotiation. So if you don't have the right selling story, if you don't manage the account well, if you're not familiar enough with category or revenue management, then actually you're at a disadvantage in the negotiation. So we've extended kind of our offering and our footprint over the last 15 years. Okay. And you talk that you're global. So just to help people, because many of us can say we're global now because of the joys of Zoom, the joys of just tech. Um, Help me understand how big is your business just maybe people or territories that you operate in so we've got 30 30 employees and we've got over 100 associates um we are employees uh, all of our employees are either in the uk the us or canada we have a franchise uh, either a franchise or associate or franchise stroke associate model in a whole bunch of other countries but we would be able to deliver our content in uh, i think it's nine languages at the last count and uh, we have we have people in over 30 countries amazing and the reason i really wanted us to talk today Because other than just being good friends and having good conversation, I am in awe of how you and another Mark, we'll talk about Mark Grice in a moment, have created Total Negotiation and scaled up. And I wanted to pick your brains on some topics of that scale up and sales, because there are going to be listeners out there who are a curious, like, how, how do you do that? Like, what, what? Is there a process to it? But also, I think there's a mindset. But secondly, the sales conversation as well. And and that's how, to go back, you and I met in that commercial territory of Guinness. So let's just go back. So there's two of you, your co-founders. So there's another Mark. I love the way you kept the name simple. Uh, Mark Grice, hopefully he's listening. What? When? When did you set up Total Negotiation? How long ago? So we set up in 2009, but we're having conversations and we're probably setting up behind the scenes in kind of 2008, but 2009 was kind of our proper setup. So yeah. uh, next year will be 15 years. Congrats. So what, mm-hmm. when you and Mark were setting up and going, okay, let's do something, what, what were you thinking you were going to do? Uh, nothing like what we've ended up doing was probably the quick answer to that. Um, So I guess Mark and I were at a similar kind of life stage where we got to a certain level commercially. 
we're looking around for other roles and the kind of typical roles that we may have gone on to do. We didn't love the idea of either of them. And Mark and I were good mates at work and outside of work. And we always, after probably probably after pint three or four, would be one of these days it would be great to do something together if ever we found the right thing. Um, so when we first set off, it was very clearly to set up a lifestyle business where hopefully we aren't similar or better than we were doing, you know, but with a whole lot lot less pressure and time and lots of time for golf and racing and stuff like that. So that's what we intend that's what we intended to do. Okay. What happened? Because that's not um, what I see now. Which is brilliant, but also something obviously happened along the way. Yeah, it's one of those you you do look back and reflect and and there's a lot of things either do they happen by accident or do they happen because you take advantage of something that was in front of you and and I often think the reality is it's a bit of both. I think the um, we were very fortunate early on in our um, early on in our business we won a big piece of work in Australia um, and what that meant was we had lots of trips out there. To give you a sense of the size and scale of that, I did four lots of two weeks in one year in Australia, which is nothing compared to Mark, who did eight separate trips. Four of them, I think, were for two weeks, four were for one week. So for 12 weeks, I think in our second year, Mark was in Australia, so a quarter of the year. And we were at the point where we'd set the business up. You, you can't walk away from that level of revenue, but equally you can't uh, allow it to, you can't have that level of kind of time away. So it forced us to think a little bit differently. So I guess that was probably the the start of the journey going in a slightly different direction from where we were originally thinking. So I, I do recall this, by the way. I remember Mark doing a lot of travel down to Australia for another friend of ours, mutual friend. Um, the lovely Jeff. The Jeff. Uh, what was it that you then said to yourselves, or what did you do to then move on again? Because it would have been easy to, from a, li- a lifestyle for Mark at that time, I think if I remember, young family as well. So he didn't want to keep being away. So what did you decide to do next? I think it's a multitude of factors. I mean, that was probably the first thing that happened. We also then won another big piece of work where I went in to originally do about 12 days in two months that ended up becoming two and a half days average for two years. So that could have put us on a totally different financial footing than you'd ordinarily be on so that that was another factor that that kind of made us realize that maybe we'd something bigger on our hands if we wanted to go after the opportunity but it also gave us a little bit more financial freedom to to get after some things that that kind of the typical i'm just out of corporate i want to dip my toe in the water see how things go we probably realized the when we were getting into the various conversations we're in, we maybe had something bigger on our hands than we than we planned or originally envisaged. And so, what would one of what did you do? So you, you're you're winning the business, but did you? What was? I'm just curious. Like, how, what did you do next? Was it a hire? Was it going to the associate model? It was some of all of those. So I guess very quick. We we needed somebody to provide the operations round us, but that's. The invoicing, the booking flights, the printing, kind of, you know, the making sure that Mark and I were spending the maximum amount of time either selling, building a pipeline or delivering. And I see those as three different things. Some people see them as two. And I know we'll, we'll likely talk about that a little bit a little bit later on. So we absolutely needed the right level of admin support around us. We then, um, we had, interestingly, reflecting back, even before we started, we'd spent money with six or eight people as associates that we trained up on our content before we went before we went live. So I think we there was always the belief and hope it could be bigger than just the two of us. It was probably this the speed of it that probably caught us out a little bit. But we definitely we definitely managed with 
associates for uh, exclusively associates i'd imagine for two or three years and it was then as time went on that kind of the we became more blended with uh associates and and employees okay and i'd love to go back to that point you said you know there's three things uh, i might misquote you selling pipeline mm-hmm. and delivery y- yep let's take each of them in turn like what do they mean to you and how does it work in your world? So I guess the the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to put things into the, the, the pipeline. So how do you create brand new opportunities, brand new sales conversations? That's the fir- that is absolutely the, 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 the first step. Um, for me, the second step then is pushing the thing through the the uh, the sausage machine of of the lead right the way to either a, a yes or a yes or a no, and then finally you've got to do really high quality of work. Um, I find a lot of people manage to do two out of those three things really well, but until you're able to do all three of those, you will run into some problems or challenges at some point. And we were very clear on all three of those right the way through. Brilliant. I absolutely agree, and I see. I think there's also then a fourth category, which is the follow up. In, and what I mean by that, all the administration that underpins all of that. Like, how do you do the 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 administration as well? And and and, and just from I'll always share my personal perspective. What goes on for me at School of Facilitation, I feel like I'm sometimes in a um, a concertina, an accordion. So sometimes I'm all in on the creating the brand new conversations, and as you say, pushing it through the sales conversation or other times I'm in there pushing it through and then doing the delivery. And you made a really interesting challenge to me once, which was Kirsty, what if you didn't do anything but sell and do your brand new conversations for six months and let everybody else do the delivery. And that was a real, yeah, I still sit with that. How did that land with you? It scared me. And, And I wanted to ask you about this because at, at the beginning, you were saying you you and Mark were doing delivery, um, but I know that the the split of roles and responsibilities changed. Um, so now you are predominantly. So yeah, describe what you do now, or maybe in the early years, how you decided to cut things up. Yeah, I think the I'm not I'm not avoiding your question, but so maybe 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 it splits into some different parts. Look, in the very early days. Um, you have everybody has to do everything and i don't just mean that when it was just mark and i you know probably when we probably when we had three extra employees who were primarily facilitators they would always have had a level of business development expectation so everybody has to be able to do everything in the early days it, it's only once you become a little bit bigger that you can start to specialize and and i think that is that is a challenging tipping point because some people some people like doing everything um and and find it very difficult to let go of some stuff there's a smile there's a smile oh, i'm smiling and uh, and it's i tell you what it is i do enjoy all three elements that we're talking about here i love the brand new conversation the excitement of taking a potential brief and then um, writing the proposal and getting it through and then I get so much satisfaction from doing the delivery, but I am beginning to recognise more and more that it, you can't do it all. Though there is always a financial gain of doing the delivery because it means you keep all the money back in the business. But it's a tipping point, and I, we'll get to that. But I'd like that conversation oh, about the tipping point. Yeah, I, 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 and it's interesting because I would argue it's a financial loss, not a financial gain. Go on. Because oh. so the money that you would save by doing twenty delivery days, I would bet as much money as you liked that if you did twenty days of business development and then got somebody to do that work, that you would be better off at the end of those twenty days than doing the twenty mm. days delivery. So here's the thing that where my I go now is about mindset, and Mark's nodding at me. So I think. One of the things I'm starting to learn from all these different conversations with business owners and solopreneurs, there is a, it's about mindset. It seems to be a defining factor here. 
So you can have the best processes in the world. You can have the most amazing product that you're selling. But there is something about mindset when you're operating and how you run. Because what was your mindset when you and Mark were sort of hitting some of those tipping points? Um, I mean, I, I, with it being 15 years, there's so many different tipping points that we've hit. Um, it's difficult. So I think the we definitely knew relatively early that building a business that was going to outlast Mark and I, whatever that looked like, was a possibility. And any decision we made for a long period of time kept that option open, but didn't commit us to a, a, a specific exit. So I think uh, the mindset was always, how do we not push ourselves into a place we need to make a definitive decision? Um, but how do we keep the option of the business outlasting Mark and I alive? And I'd also like to hypothesize that you had a, a mindset of, we can do this. Like, we can't, yeah, why, if not us, who sort of mentality, of course we can do this. Both Mark and I have a relatively strong um, desire to win at anything, always. Um, and I know you'll have seen, particularly from me, some examples of what it's like when I don't win. Uh, but therefore, when you translate that to the business situation, um, every opportunity is like, how do I maximize it? How am I going to do it? And, you know, it's a double edged sword because I sometimes wish we'd, we'd had a run at slightly less opportunities. However, if we'd done that, maybe we'd not have had a run at some of the opportunities that have been the, have delivered the biggest benefit. And who knows the answer? Who knows the answer to that? You, you make your best choice that you can at that point in time, and and then wherever that takes you, you move you move from there. But just even listening to you, there is this something about the self belief and an inner knowing that you can do it, and and that's okay because again, we can have great processes, behaviours, products, but if I, it genuinely, I do think there's a something about the inner belief system that makes it work or not work. It, it's interesting. I know one of the um, questions you often ask is what advice would you give somebody starting out? Mm. And and kind of my answer to that is back yourself, be brave and be bold. And, and that probably is kind of how we've got to where we've got to. Yeah. Because we've backed ourselves, we've been brave and, and we've made the bold decision every time we possibly can. And I also think... This is a, my woo-woo here, Mark. Mr. Logic, Kirsty's woo-woo. The universe gives you what you need at the time. So the fact that you were getting those opportunities was obviously it was meant to be. And then you took them. So it was it was meant to be at that point. We tried um, to take all of them. We tried to take them all. We certainly didn't get we certainly didn't get everything right. That would be um that would not be right or true. Can we talk a bit about um selling because that's probably a common background that you and I have and I am noticing more and more working with my peers there are some people who are really comfortable going into those sales conversations you know creating the brand new conversation and pushing it through and then there's others who are a bit like oh how do you do that and you and I both you more than me commercial beasts and we had really great grounding on how to sell how to approach clients and customers um what are your thoughts what can we share with people around like how do you do the creating brand new conversations piece at this time this so again that changes over time um so i guess i guess the first thing is sometimes when you ask a question um, if somebody's got a natural spike, they sometimes don't realise it, don't know it, and therefore it's just in their nature. So I think for Mark and I, there's a lot of stuff that we do that is just in our nature, and that's quite. That you know, I know that's not helpful for people listening because it, but it, it's difficult to put into kind of a wrapper or a label or a box. I do think the um, one of the things that has certainly served our business really well is the network and the extended network and you know 
I would wager after 10 years, about 80% of our turnover across the whole 10 years added together would either have come from somebody we knew or somebody who knew somebody we knew or somebody we'd done some work for who then went to somewhere else. So so that would be a huge um, level of our turnover and our, and our growth. And I think the the factors that help there that you could replicate is one of the things that's always been very consistent in me is I've always kept up with people I get on with. And therefore, I'm not only reaching out and contacting them because I want something or I need something, you know, so 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 you and I have, you know, we probably chat two, three times a year. We maybe manage to get together every 12 months or every 18 months. But we do it with no agenda. Is there's there's nothing that's there's there's, there's nothing. We're not doing it because there's something in it for for either of us. So I think I think having a having a personality where you are in regular contact with people helps. I I also then think the delivering a br- brilliant product allows you to then more naturally and easily ask for other referrals so not being frightened to go if i did a great job for you who else in your team would help would benefit from this which other business do do you have some other and and not being frightened to do that because you know if you've done a really good job for people well i guess there's two times you want to tell somebody about a job that somebody did for you if it's awful you want to tell everybody to have a bit of a moan and make sure nobody uses them again But actually, if you found something that's really good and really helpful, that's a really nice conversation to have as well. So if you're if you're always delivering to a brilliant standard, I think that makes it I think that that makes it easier as well. Um, On the bit about what we would call it in our language, stakeholder management. So thinking about the stakeholders you just mentioned, people I've worked with, maybe directly people we've done work for and then people who have been in our training and maybe gone somewhere else how do you how do you keep track of who those people are and and where they are and how to talk to them uh god there's a lot that you you're asking more than one question at the same time my very simple sales brain doesn't work that right um so I, I i guess there is um increasingly as we've got bigger there is a database that's there that we are much more disciplined much more disciplined around and you know with 30 employees we have to be that way you can't you can't keep stuff up in your head but being candid for about the first five seven eight years i'd have had an excel spreadsheet that was regularly updated and i would be on linkedin um Every three months, I'd spend two or three hours on LinkedIn, seeing who'd moved, seeing where they'd moved from and to, who knew who, you know, because again, if you're, if you're thinking about trying to create some connections or some new, new business, you'll have an idea of which type of customers you want to go to. You'll have a type of, you, you'll have a sense of who are the job titles that could either say yes or no or point you in the right direction. And, you know, we're never far away from those pe- people on, on LinkedIn. It's very, it's very rare. Um, you know, I, I would say it would be very rare that there is somebody that we want to talk to as a business that isn't a third connection at worst of somebody, somebody in the business. And when I say third connection, I probably mean quite a good third connection. So, of course, we've all connected to people that we kind of met once and there's no relationship with, but but actually kind of a relatively warm connection. Usually you're usually you're two away, one or two away, but you're rarely more than three. And once you've got those people identified, as you said, you've gone through LinkedIn, you've looked at where people have moved to. How do you approach people? It'd be different in different situ- different in different situations. Um, you know, we we one of the things I'm really proud of is we're a major sponsor of Grocery Aid, which is which is one of the charities. Uh, they have a, they, they do lots of great events during the year. We also sponsor, so we were a sponsor of the sports lunch and the DNI uh, back in October, and they're great opportunities where you're everybody's together. And it's a couple of minute introductions that somebody makes that that leads to 
a coffee and a chat later. It's not a hard sell, but you know, it was really nice. You know, I've got uh, I've got a dinner coming up with the uh, with the sales director because a another sales director said these guys have done such an amazing job. You guys should grab dinner and they'll tell you about it. And of course, people are interested to learn because. You know, if we can help make their team better, deliver a better commercial outcome, it, it works for everybody. So so that would be, you know, th- there are gentle networking at specific at specific events. We've also we also, you know, there was a an occasion where there was a major bit of news um where a supplier was having a big issue with a retailer. And I looked up the CEO and emailed the CEO and said, this is the type of thing that we can help with. I've noticed this article. If you think we can help, we're here for a conversation. So having the finger having the finger on the pulse meant I think that article was uh, in there on the Thursday. I think I met them on the Tuesday. And I think we started doing some work to help them on the Thursday. So again, there's lots of, but, but again, we've got, we've, we're, a, we're a hungry business. But what could be a basic thing? I mean, do you, email people do you phone them do you send them a message in linkedin i i, I would do either depending on the depending on the situation i mean the, the i used to be better being candid i used to be really good at doing it i'm less good now because i used to do a lot of client work that would finish at 5 five thirty, and i used to have about an hour and a half drive home and i was just really good at four or five 15 minute conversations kind of once every couple of months with them just to check in and see how they were doing so so that was easier in those days i think i think where you've worked with somebody it's also easier it's like you know we did the you know how are the team doing with it is there any stuff how was the last negotiation with tesco is there any stuff that you guys have learned is there any are there any new issues or challenges so i think i think the and and, and, I, and i'm phoning because i'm genuinely interested of course if an opportunity comes along that the, the team need but but it's about keeping yourself top of mind at the right time so definitely phone calls where there is a good uh there is a good um relationship there again sometimes i'll see a really interesting article that links to something that somebody said to me or or some of the challenges that they may have so kind of going listen i was thinking of you i remember when we spoke at this point you were saying this was a challenge for you i found this interesting and again i'm just providing a an idea or an article that that may help them. I'm not. I'm not doing it because I'm trying to sell you something. So, for me, it's just a. Uh, um, th- there is no. There's lots of little things. No one big thing. No, that's okay. And it's really interesting to the way you say it's like you talk to those people not from a place of I want to sell you something. It's it's genuinely. I know I just want to have a conversation with you. I want to hear how things are going for you. Or I want to share something with you. Um, and to and the mentality of, and a byproduct of that is I will then, or total negotiation will be top of mind in the future. And or people go, oh yeah, oh Mark, we should talk to Mark because I remember that conversation or that article he sent me. So that's something that our listeners could easily do within their own world with their own topics as well. So that's really, really, really helpful. Um, So that's creating brand new conversations. So you start to get into the conversations. Um, What are some of your thoughts on having those initial calls with clients? What do people need to think about? Um, I, you really don't know much more than 20 percent of the conversation that you're about to have because if you're selling you are asking brilliant questions and you have no idea what answers they're going to they're going to give you so i think being you know really having really well prepared questions just help you of of course if the answers they're giving are playing into the space that 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 is helpful for you then you're liable to go on and talk about some thoughts about how you could do it but but the often some of the best pieces of work you'll go on to do when you come off the first conversation you've no idea what the solution solution looks like so i think the really poor salespeople are just there to sell their what they've already pre-decided that you know my, my bugbear 
is the emails. So, you know, put yourself in my shoes. I, I, I'm a very strong red for those people that are in insights. Therefore, I'm very confident in my own um, ability, rightly or wrongly. My kind of mantra is back yourself, be brave, be bold. And I've got somebody that wants to email me telling me that they can grow my business by uh, some outbound leads who knows nothing about my business, asks me no questions. It's just like, literally, you have no chance ever. It is the wasted email. Because it's like, if somebody came on and said to me, Mark, how good are you at lead generation? What what do you think you're really good at? What do you think you're not so good at? How have you learned from the conversation? A great conversation could well persuade me that we need to do something in that space. But somebody just emailing me, telling me how wonderful they are, it's like, and, and, and part of my brain goes, if you were that wonderful, you wouldn't be emailing me. Yeah. And I love that what you just said is, you know, you go into those conversations, initial conversations with clients and customers, 20% of an idea of what a potential outcome could be, but you just don't know. And therefore, having your questions ready to go are so important. I can't, like, um, stress that enough. And please people write your questions down and the reason for writing questions down is it frees up your brain to be really listening and watching what's going on in this context now often in zoom or ms teams or when you're physically in the room and you don't forget i i i write down the 10 questions and it's usually the same 10 questions that i'm going to ask for every first business development meeting because it's really important that I understand kind of the potential needs that the, the, per, the yeah. person has. And it's understanding those needs. Um, another tool, I don't know if you still use it. Another tool I use in all my meetings is a post. So um, this is something we got taught many years ago. And post stands for purpose, outcome, structure and time. And my team still laugh, especially some of the ex-Guinness, when I use it at the beginning of a client call. I'm like, can we just really clarify what the purpose of today is? And then I go around the room and ask everybody to share what they would like from our conversation. And you can see those who know what I'm doing go, oh, yeah. But also it really helps. I've noticed it helps the client frame what they want to achieve from their time, that one hour that you often have initially. But then it allows me to go, okay, this is what they want to achieve. Therefore, this is where we navigate the conversation. Yep. Um, we, we use we use uh, posts, sometimes pods internally. We use them slightly less externally, but maybe there's an opportunity for us to, to think about that. I think we might use it without realising. I think it becomes just a, a behaviour. You just, just use it. Um, fantastic. Um what else, if anything, around those sales conversations would you suggest to people at this time? Maybe it's not the area you want to go to. I guess just coming back to that concertina or the accordion you described, really thinking about the three, and, and you've got the four things, look, follow up is, follow up is critical um, for sure, but are you spending enough time in all three of those areas and are you flexing those three areas at different times? Because you shouldn't be spending the same amount of time in all of them. It's not a 30, 30, 30. It might be 70, 10, 10 for a while, but then it might be 20, 40, 30. So it, for me, it's just a constant lens that that kind of uh, I'm always thinking about because if I don't think about it, I'll trip myself up. I think it's a really, really good challenge. And where I see this happening for others and myself is when you spend too much time in one space and you forget, you don't forget, that's really unfair. You spend too much time delivering, but then what happens is you don't give any time over to opening up new conversations and you come to the end of a very busy period of delivery and suddenly your diary is like quiet. And sometimes some people are intelligent enough to go, oh, I've realised what I've done there. Others are like, oh, my God. And and this is true, I think, for both if you're running your own business, but also if you're an associate. So even as an associate, you need to be thinking, where am I finding some new work or who am I talking to um, in, a, in an agency? I, totally. The, 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 you, you're spot on. The bucket I see getting either missed or not enough time is creating new. 
and and it creates a horrible feeling and tension that if you can get rid of the world feels very different because what how i would describe people that struggle um either to run a small consulting business or to be an associate is you've got this feeling of I have to take every day that's available to me because I don't know what's coming next. And therefore, you've got this feeling of, I'm working really hard, I'm really hard, I've got money in the bank, I'm now going to have some time to enjoy that money, but, oh, my God, I've got nothing coming in for the next. So actually what I need to do is not enjoy it. I now need to ref. So therefore, that kind of work-life balance that, that a perfect associate model can deliver doesn't. You just feel the whole time feeling I'm, I'm either having to work way too hard or I'm panicking because I'm not doing anything. And until you, until you get those three things into some sort of balance, you just have this really awkward feeling. I love that. You gave me a phrase before we start to wrap up, but you, you said to me, I need to sell today, tomorrow, next month, next year. Is that one of your phrases? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Just describe, I mean, it sounds obvious, but what's that, when you say that to yourself or to someone in your team, what is that intimating to them? It can mean a couple of things. I think if I talk about it as a business owner where you've got employees, you know, one of the biggest commitments that we have is to our employees. And one of the, well, probably the thing they are most keen that we do is pay them every month. And the way to pay them is to make sure that we're winning and doing enough work today, tomorrow, and next week. But what you want to do is you also want to grow the business for the future, which is where kind of next quarter, next year comes in. So kind of that mindset of making sure you get enough for the short term, the medium term, and the long term is what I'm trying to get at. And it's very easy, particularly as you get bigger and you're talking to bigger clients in multiple markets, it's really easy to get distracted about the massive piece of work that will deliver your growth for the next year. But guess what? They take a long time to win. They're usually multiple stakeholders, multiple markets. They're more likely to be delayed. So if you get really, really focused in the, in the kind of more than three months out, you'll start to hit some issues in cash flow in the kind of in, in the period to kind of get there and then that what what that causes is a knee a knee jerk reaction so just always being mindful of that you know short medium long term so that's definitely from an employer point of view to to be able to provide kind of what we are committed to providing for all of our employees for the associates as well, associates don't really want a relationship where I do 50 days with you in quarter one, nothing in quarter two and 75 in quarter three and then nothing. So it, it doesn't really work for, for them either. So it's right for employees and associates. But even if you're just an associate yourself or you, you're a one man or two man, two, per, two person band, that mindset of um, am I am I doing enough to be comfortable today, and then enough to build the future? So, so for me, it's well. There are different importances, or uh, as, as depending on your situation, the concept and principle remains the same for me. Mm. Now, I think you and I could carry on talking for at least another hour quite easily. I've got so many questions, but I have some quick fire questions to ask you. Mm-hmm. as we go in to the final straight um you've already given us some really good advice but what other advice would you give someone starting out as a facilitator or trainer at this time i think if so if you want some advice to be an associate is be the easiest associate to deal with oh, and what does that look like and sound like what does that look like so that that means be very keen, very eager, very hunger. Understand there are times that things will change and you don't want to be working with a business that's taking the mickey in that space because some businesses some businesses do. But things do change and part of the, there are many benefits to being an associate, but there are some downsides, which is sometimes the business will need to favour employees. 
Um, but great associates go the extra mile. They try and generate leads. If you're in delivering work for a client and you're doing it really well, and you can also generate a lead to deliver more work, well, guess who I'm going to ask to do that work? And you know, for me, there aren't. There, it's a very rare associate that that generates leads or wins work or supports in the winning work. So those are absolutely worth their weight in gold. So from an associate point of view, the it will come back to you in spades, um, and the kind of the the the, the cost benefit for me. Um, I know we've got three or four associates that, that 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 live and breathe that every day, and I know why they I know why they live and breathe it every day, and it, it, it's good for them and good for us. Yeah, brilliant. Who do you follow in social media land that you think others should? Uh, you know when you you know when you're on Family Fortunes and you get the big. Eh, eh, it's just not it's just not it's just not it's just not me there's loads of great stuff out there but it's not a place it's not a place i go fishing and it'd be probably golf orientated anyway um what book do you recommend to people so the book i would recommend is a book called rich dad poor dad by robert kiyosaki it's not a pure business book but it's just got a very interesting way to think about um, money and investments um, I got into trouble with my good lady wife for giving it to my 16 year old son on his birthday because I felt it was important reading for him um, but actually he's really enjoyed it and taken a lot from it and I think it's a, a really good mindset book that certainly served me well over the years amazing Mark thank you so much for being my guest today it's been great conversation i've i've learned a lot and i'm pretty sure our listeners have learned um, things too we'll put all your connections uh, in the show notes so people can find you on linkedin or they can find the total negotiation website if they'd like to understand more about your business but thank you for being here today and thank you too look forward to another com conversation with the paint of the black stuff at some point awesome take care